right. That's why they're making such bad, immoral decisions. As they're basing their their decisions off their passions, off their feelings, not on sound reason and logic. But I just don't know how realistic that are. I would say um, people aren't generally reasonable. And maybe I'm being too cynical, but I don't know. I see a lot of people. I try to reason with people every day, and I just feel like I'm talking to a wall. They're just like, Whoa, I'm going to do what I want to do. Don't confuse me with the facts. And you can point out all these reasons why, and they just want, want to experience the moment. They don't want to think about it, because that might take away the fun. What else? Any more pros or cons? The pros, I, I love the universality of it. And I also, I would even say this is like a true ethic. And you might say, wow, that's really a big adjective for giving that. You haven't given that to anyone else's. Well, I really like how he distinguishes right action and the, the motivation or intention behind it from just doing right or wrong behavior you're based on the payoff and the reward. I think that's a really great insight by Kant. Here you're doing right because it's right, not because of what you're going to get from it. You're making correct ethical decisions because they're correct ethical decisions. It's the reasonable, rational thing to do. It's your duty. So it's not about, I'm going to get a gold star on my door or a jewel in my crown. Or mama's going to hit me with the ruler or Jesus is going to throw me into hell. It's not, that's not what's guiding your decisions. What's guiding it is like the clear light of reason. Which maybe this could come back down to the cons. Our reason. is fallible. At least mine is. And even I think Kant, God bless him, I think his probably was too, even if he didn't realize it. Now, if you've never made a mistake in your reasoning, maybe this doesn't apply to you, but I think for most people it does. And then the biggest problem for me is, like with other reason-based theories, it's the rationalization. And this is where, if you allow it to get specific, you can rationalize anything using Kantian ethics. It just depends how you word the categorical imperative. Like when I was studying ethics at San Diego State, uh, we had a pretty openly um, gay man in our classes. And him, like the rest of us, whenever we were studying different theories, we would try to figure out how this applied to our, our lives. And, and as he's working out the categorical imperative, he raises his hand. And this, this was a really nice guy, really high values, really loving, kind. And he asked the teacher, he says, um, I guess Kant wouldn't believe in homosexual relationships because would I want all people in all places at all times to be in a homosexual relationship? And he says, even as a gay man, no, because, I mean, it would ruin the species as we know it, etc. <laughs> There's like all kinds of reasons not. And what really surprised me was our teacher, uh, Dr. Mary Greger at San Diego State, and she was a world-class Kantian scholar. I mean, she knew Kant like your Bible professors here know the Bible. And you could ask her any question on Kant, and she could, you know, quote chapter and verse. And, and she, her biggest dilemma was trying to figure out how to answer you, whether you wanted the little answer or the big answer, and all the, the angles. She would even correct Kant as she'd be reading him in class, like, oh, Kant got a little ahead of himself here. He should have saved this argument for a few chapters down the way. So she was amazing. But she told the student, she said, well, it depends how you ask the question. What if you ask, would I want all people in all places at all times with homosexual tendencies to practice homosexuality? Well, now you can get a very different answer, can't you? 
because now it's just applying to a particular subgroup and not to population at large. But I don't think Kant wants to do it that way. I think he wants it just to be across the board. But we're not, we're all individuals. This doesn't really allow for that kind of individual ethical decision because it's just grouping us all of this category of like humans or sentient beings. But that's not how we're living our life. We're not living it as a block of humanity. If we were, this would be a tremendous ethic. But because we're each in the, all individuals with individual dilemmas and issues, you could see how our minds might kind of alter the, the formula a little bit. But that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where real ethics are happening. Not up here, but down here in the gutter, in the dirt, right? Years later, I was at another national park, this time with my grandma Gigi. And, oh, maybe I shouldn't say this on the phone, but who cares? Okay. <laughs> Anyways, we're, we're at, I think it was Mesa Verde, uh, where the ancient ones lived, the Anasazi, some of the oldest continuously inhabited places. And I was really into, like, Native American religion at that time in my life and um, trying to follow the sacred ways, walk the sacred path. And on top of these mesas, the pueblos, you had these mesas and then you had these, like, caves or kind of indentations where they built the pueblos, the cliff dwellings underneath. And so I'm walking on top of my grandma and there's all this amazing sage growing. And I've been studying about sage, its medicinal properties, but mostly its spiritual properties, how you could use it for purification. And like a true Native American, I was asking each plant, you know, if I could have some of the sage, and I had this huge bundle. And I was only taking what I needed, though. I was going to, like, package it and sell it on eBay or something. Well, this was way before eBay. But anyways, I had this nice little bundle for my personal spiritual use. And my grandmother turns to me and she said, Fred Blackburn, what do you think you're doing? I said, what do you mean, grandmother? And she said, can't you read the signs? It says, don't touch or take anything. You can take pictures, leave only footprints. And I was just like, I said, it's okay, grandmother. I got permission. And she said, okay. And so we continued down the mesa, and about a half mile later, she turned around and she said, permission from whom? Because we were the only ones there. And I said, well, from the plants, of course. I asked each individual plant if it would share with me, and they said yes. And she said, I thought you got permission from a ranger. I said, why would I ask a ranger? I'm not taking anything from them. I'm taking it from the plants. And I was perfectly justified because I asked myself, would I want all people, in all places, at all times, who had a deep and abiding love for the sacred ways of Native Americans and treated the plants and animals in a sacred way and asked permission from them to have some of their holy sage, would I want them to take that? My answer was an indu indubitable yes. And so I did, with a clear conscience. And I have a lot more stories like that where that came from, where I call it special dispensations <laughs> because of who I am, Fred Blackburn. <laughs> and it does create a problem because you can do this categorical imperative and end up doing and taking and saying all sorts of things um, if you have the right wording in your head. All right, hope that worked for you. We can critique more of this later if we need to.